Hi, this is Harold Cooper, and before we jump into this podcast interview, I just wanted to share that I've been lucky enough over the last couple of years to have interviewed a bunch of other leading therapists and agents of change, really exploring their take on everything rapid change related. What you're about to see it was recorded a little while ago, but it still holds tremendous value if you're someone that wants to learn about how to help people make quick behavioral shifts. So I hope you enjoy, and to make sure you don't miss any of the new releases, then take action and click that subscribe button, and then you'll be kept in the loop when any new episodes come out. Welcome to the Rapid Change Matters podcast. My name is Howard Cooper, and for over 14 years now, I've been fascinated with helping people to create personal change quickly. But I still come across many who believe that lasting personal change has to take a long time consisting of reliving traumas or deep psychological analysis, or simply that flawed notion that understanding why you have a problem will somehow make it go away. I'm on a mission to get people who work therapeutically with others to shift their thinking and realize that these beliefs are not written in stone. Rapid change can happen. So, to help you open up to what's possible, I'm interviewing top therapists and agents of change who are out there getting real results with real people really quickly. Before we get to the interview, I just wanted to let you know that I've written a quick-to-read, downloadable PDF on five strategies to amplify your client's response with some great tips on getting your therapeutic suggestions to really sizzle. You can download this for free from rapidchange.works, where you can also find all the information about this episode and episodes still to come. Now, over to the interview. And I'm joined today by the one and only Bob Burns. Bob has been involved in hypnosis and change work for over 40 years, training people all over the world. He also mentors and teaches his methods live in his therapy rooms in Montrose, Scotland, and is one of the only individuals to offer training in this particular way. Additionally, his creation of the SWAN Protocol has helped so many people to overcome issues, often with dramatic and rapid results, which is why therapists and healers in more than 50 countries around the world testify to its efficacy. We're very privileged to have him here today. Welcome, Bob. Hey, Howard. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm really well, thank you. Really well. So um, really just to kick us off, I wonder if you could tell us um, really a little about you, how you got started and where, where you stand and where your thoughts are around rapid change. So uh, I started off in the, uh, I used to be a, a musician in the early 70s and uh, I did hypnosis for a bit of fun at one gig and um, that got me going. I left it for a while, came back to it again, but it was performance hypnosis. Mm-hmm. So I trained as a, as a magician and a mentalist and even to this day I still do some corporate work in that field and I use my hypnosis for that. If it works, it works. If it doesn't work, I make it look like it is working. But again, that's belts and braces, and that's the <laughs> that'll be the showman in me. As far as the uh, it's the therapy part goes, as you just said, I'm, I work as a clinical hypnotist, and um, so I work in the therapy room, trying to create change in a far, far quicker way than they do in the uh, in the white coat world, if you like. Mm-hmm. As far as rapid change goes, I know that you're a rapid change worker. I know that lots of people are. I don't call myself that, but again, I'm back to what rapid change actually is. By that, I simply mean is I'm not looking to to fix somebody in five minutes. If I can, I can, and very often I can, like thousands of other therapists. But I want to fix them sooner rather than later. I get the the whole idea that you're aware there's there's people out there saying it takes time, it takes a long time, and you've got to do this and you've got to do that. And much of the the, the evidence based before us is, no, no, it doesn't have to. Sometimes it can be much, much, much quicker, and sometimes it can be instant, and sometimes it can be in areas that we don't even understand which is quite cool in this way, but we'll, you know, we get there, we mm. get there. So, I mean, you mentioned that um, your approaches may be different from the sort of white-collar uh, world uh, of change work or therapy. How, how is it different, and, you know, what, what, what do you mean by the white-collar world of change work? Well, what, what I meant was, I meant the, the white coat world. The white meant, coat, yes. I meant allopathic medicine. Mm-hmm. So my background is, uh, you know, academically changed, uh, uh, academically trained in psychology, sociology, philosophy. It's a world I thought I was going to go into to become a psychologist. I didn't. Many of my friends did. I moved to this thing called, that we call hypnosis. And um, 
and and even then, in, in, in there are worlds within that world, isn't there? So my world, after a while, was to get involved in analysis because it was next door to psychology, mm-hmm. and the whole idea of hypnoanalysis is to get them to close their eyes, take a nice deep breath, and you you bring up parts in their life, and they tell tell you what was happening at that times in their life. Uh, take you back to a time you're just about four, you're at your mother's knee, you're happy. Well, what's happening? Take a time of three and a half, you're at school, you're feeling really, really scared. What's happening? And so on and so forth. Some people think that's Freudian. It's, 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 it can be looked as a Freudian form of therapy, but um, I prefer to call it free association. Uh, I'm not looking for a sexual happening at all, although many times in hypnoanalysis, that is a belief that it was caused by something that happened very, very young. Uh, it was, many of them think, 100% like Freud. It would have been a sexual thing and that the person would have felt um, A, pleasure, followed immediately by B, guilt, followed immediately by C, hiding that guilt. It lies away for 20, 30, 40 years, boom. Suddenly they're scared of spiders, so on and so forth. That's a hell of a scattered nutshell I've just thrown at you there. (laughs) My apologies for that. But that, that was my world. And my world was that I had to go and find out where it was. I had to go and find the source. I had to go and find the cause of the effect. Mm -hmm. And then uh, some years later, I remember Anthony Jacquin, a wonderful therapist, Anthony Anthony saying, uh, but maybe maybe you don't have to uh, find out. Maybe why why do you have to go and, not his words, I'm paraphrasing now, but why do you have to stick your head in? Why do you have to know exactly what happened? That dark room back then. And uh, Anthony's dad, I believe, uh, Freddie Jacquin, again, wonderful, another great therapist, his background would have been in the hypnoanalysis as well in the, in the earlier years. So I thought, can I, can I really, should I, should, I, should I spend less time doing that and just trying to do this? And sometimes, and even now today, I find that that's the case. When I'd say to the part, in fact, I do know, in my, in, if I get to talk to the part verbally, I'll say, do, and do I need to know? So that will always come up in some part of my, my opening either consultation or first session. And do I need to know? Should we go back so that I find out? And very often I'll get, well, no. Well, no, I, I, I get that that's what you're saying. So I said, well, could you just fix it then? Well, yeah. Mm. So a couple of years ago, somebody told me that. I would say, well, don't, don't be stupid. <laughs> can't, can't work like that. But very often, you know, we just get the empirical evidence that that's exactly what happened. The person opens their eyes, they go away, they come back again the next week, and they tell you that they're pretty much sure they're fixed. And it goes on like that for, well, forever in many, many cases. So I think because I, I believe that there are a lot of uh, people out there that really have a, a, a set idea that understanding why some why you're screwed up or why you have an issue is the key to unlocking it. And what you're saying is that that's not always the case. No, in fact, most of the people I, I work with now, I often do this when I do uh, workshops. You know, a lot of people say, what do you specialize in? What do you what do you do? And I've come to the conclusion over many years that nearly everything I treat now, Howard, is anxiety or uh, a form of anxiety. So people come to to me, to us, with anxiety. And that means that they are ill. That means they're wrong. That means that we all have white hats. And they have a black hat because they're not like us. They're ill. They're anxious. They're suffering from anxiety. But if you if you spend a few moments and sit back, pour yourself a glass of wine and think what, what the situation is. You know, we're, we're on this lump of grit flying through Earth at goodness how many hundreds of thousands of miles a second. And we're just clinging on. And we're not anxious, and they are. And, 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 and they're the stupid ones. So it makes me it makes me kind of look at it a different way and say, well, geez, maybe you know stuff that we don't know, and maybe we should all be listening to you. But it would be nice if we could handle it. So my back to that lovely question, I think it was Susan Jeffers many years ago, she had those two questions. What's the worst possible thing that could happen? And the second question, can you handle it? And if the answer to the second question is yes, then the world is yours. Okay, that's my wording, but I'm sure that's what Susan meant. <laughs> <laughs> amazing amazing well look I, I i'd love to talk to you a little bit about uh more about the swan protocol and and how that's impacted you know people getting uh potentially some really great uh rapid results um but I, i'm wondering actually if you can give us a, a couple of real examples of people that have experienced rapid change i think i was doing a thing in in here in Montrose maybe two or three years ago and i had a, a group of about 15 people i think and um uh, a couple of the guys there on the court, they were talking about how they fix everyone in one session. One session, and they're fixed. And um, we'll maybe come back to that later, I don't know. So we, had, we all had a good discussion on that one, as you can imagine. That's a thing that's on forums forever. The guy who hypnotizes somebody, they're fixed forever. But we, we could understand in talking to these guys that they weren't lying. 
You know, they, they were they were believing that. And there's a whole there's a whole thing we could talk about on that and why that is, why people can say that. And they're not actually lying. That's a really interesting one. But in the room at that time was a man called uh, uh, John, who was one of the, the delegates there. But what nobody, no, what nobody knew was he had also been a client of mine uh, a couple of years earlier. He came to me for body dysmorphia. And for the listener who doesn't understand that, um, you know, it's somebody who's uh, really ashamed of the body. They, they think they're ugly. It's mainly mainly in young women, but young men can get it as well. There's a small percentage of the population that gets it. I can't think of off the top of my head, but it's it's small. And in looking up and reading up, uh, I read that it's supposed to be impossible to actually cure. I had 11 sessions. And John went to talk about uh, this situation with, with these people when we were talking about fast, and, fast, fast cures and that. And as he got into his, into his talk, it was that, that opening part when people talk about themselves and how they come into it and so on and so forth. And I stopped him and I said, John, I should, I should stop you and tell you now that nobody in this room knows that you are a, a client of mine. And he said, it's okay, I'm happy. I want to come out and let everybody know this story and, and what you went on to do. And he told them the, the, the very, very absolute, completely true story that it's session 11. He's, he's, in my, he's come along for session 11. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, I'm looking at a real stumor here. Everybody, <laughs> they've, they've come to me to, to find the wonders of this therapist. Looks like he takes a couple of years. Anyway, and it was one of my longest ones, I have to say. But in session 11, he sat before me. I can tell you that he'd never gone into hypnosis. He'd never done anything. But I had this new thing called the swan that I was going to play with, with him. And we did this thing, and and he, he never he never even did that. It, it didn't work. <laughs> so I just didn't work. And uh, he looked at me, and I said, I'll tell you what, why don't you? And he says, the reason why I'm crying is because I know that you can't help me. And and that's the reason why. He got very emotional. And he says, the reason is, that's it, after you, I can't see. But he'd done the psychiatry, the psychologist. And he says, well, why don't you just relax, sit back, relax, I'll chat to you away. And that's a voice of mine. And you come back every week, and we'll grow old together. Don't bring any money ever. We'll just see what happens. He giggled, closed his eyes. <clears throat> and his story is, and I think it's really true, that five, ten minutes, that was him fixed. Completely fixed. He opens his eyes. He, say, he smiles. He says to me, you know, I'm feeling really great. And, and to cut a long story short, I think the, I think the end part of it, uh, how old is this? I think that part within him, whatever it was, this part that was clinging on, heard me say, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you just keep coming back to see me, hypno boy here, every Monday at five. We'll grow old together. And I think it said, fuck you. That's yeah. not going to happen. I'm not coming back here every year with you. You wee goatee beard, shutting away to me, and your nice soft voice. It's not going to happen. And, it, and it, just, it just pissed off. And that was um, fixed. There's lots of stories I could go into and tell you about, John. I'll leave it that for now. Yeah. Yeah. Suffice to say, that would have been him fixed. That's a, that's a story that would stick out in my mind. But there's, a, there's an, another another uh, lady who, is, who came to see me for severe, I'm talking about severe pain, including lots of things, including the dreaded fibromyalgia, which we can never find, but it's all over the bloody place. And Anyway, to cut a long story short, now she was a good subject. She was a good hypnotic subject. And uh, she just went, she just went bang. Uh, I talked to her part, the part came through, we got the right voice, where it was talking to me. It talked to me like this, call me Mr. Burns. It was a very high voice, so beautiful, lovely, kind of like a Fife accent. Hello, Mr. Burns. And this went on for a while. And I said, look, she's in agony. Do you think there's anything you can do to help? Yeah. You, should we need to go back and find out where it is? No, not really. Uh, well, could you take away our pain? I think I could. But could you talk? Yeah, yes, I can. So could you do it now? Uh-huh. Well, we'll do it right now. Then, okay. Tell me when you've done it. That's it done. And I'm thinking, well, this is just a complete friggin' disaster. Thank God, there's nobody watching. You know. <laughs> so, uh, one, two, wide awake. Girl comes back, and she starts to scream. So the secretary from a, a place next door comes running in. She thinks the woman's being raped or something. But she's just so happy. She's hugging me and screaming again and again and again because she's no pain. So, but no, I'm not happy because we, we want to know, do we? We want to know something. We don't have to be scientists completely, but we want to know just a little bit about what went on. Uh, so I pop her under again. I asked the part to come back again, and back she comes. This wonderful part. Let's call her Denise. Mm -hmm. And so, hi, Denise. Hello, Mr. Barons. So, look, look, what's the story here? She's been in agony for years, and you come back, and I ask you, and you just fix it. Yeah. And so, so why wouldn't you have fixed it earlier? Which I think is a fairly good Heavy scientific question. Why didn't you? Why didn't you just fix it earlier? <laughs> and this is the this is the answer I got, Mister Burns. You need to understand something. This is what you do, and this is what we do. 
You, you contact us, you tell us what to do, and we do it. That's how it works. And with that, nodded off, and that was it. That was her. There's another story to that where she went on. It lasted for a week. It came back the day before. Lots of therapists will understand this perfectly. It's almost like they've, they've got to have something to, to, to reveal to you, to show you, to, to do it again. It's almost like the part gets quite excited and enjoys the therapy room. But we, we, we got that fixed over the period of four or five sessions mm-hmm. where we built up uh, some stuff that I lodged in her mind behind her right ear that she could just use some kind of mixture that I made up a la the, the work of a wonderful therapist, Barry Thien. So it's a good idea, doesn't care who uses it. And I steal all of Barry Thien's ideas. He'll never listen to this. He's, he, he, I, don't, I don't think he can operate radios and machines and stuff. <laughs> it's just amazing. It's just amazing. And I mean, I'm actually just sitting here almost trying to listen to this from through the perspective of, uh, of someone who's never come across this way of working or this way of thinking about yeah. things. And it would probably sound... Uh, almost fantastical, or in many ways too fantastical to be true. Yes. So what I'm saying is, you know you get these guys who say, this is how it works. So Tom tells you that, then Dick tells you, no, it actually works like this. Then Harriet comes along, she's got some great ideas. She tells you it's something else. In my experience, none of them are lying. All of that is true. But through this thing called experience, we get to try all these things, and we get to, to discover, and much to a surprise, that all of them work at different times. And the secret is to know which arrow to pull out of that quiver, yeah? Mm. And I don't, I don't get that right. In fact, I, I make more mistakes now than I've ever made. But my recovery rate, rate is much faster than ever before. I, I mean, I've got a couple of questions about, about the SWAN protocol. And I'm just wondering, actually, whether it would make sense uh, for the listeners, if they haven't come across it, for you to give us kind of a, uh, a brief outline of what it is. Well, uh, in, in, in many ways, I'm, the, I'm almost the worst person to ask about it because my... Uh, my dice is, uh, uh, are fairly well loaded, um, but I'm okay about it. There's something that happened when I ran my fingers through my hair some years ago while watching breakfast TV. I looked at my elbow, my hand was hung in the shape of a swan. I laughed and said, you look a bit like a swan. My hand nodded, which made me kind of giggle a little bit. I was into and understood very much so idiomotor response and the work of, uh, of uh, Chevrolet from all, all these years ago. Uh, then I, I, I asked it to turn, it turned, then it nodded again, and I go, yeses and noes, it turned back. And, and and it was, to cut a long story short, it, I, it was a kind of an unbelievable experience for me because I was not a natural hypnotee and not good with idiomotor responses at all. You know, I don't do the finger lifting for yes and the other one for no. I don't do that. So I shouted on my wife to come from upstairs and I showed her what I did. And because she knows me, and although I might have a sense of humor, it would probably be better than making my hand go floppy to look like a swan, you know. Uh, so she believed me. Uh, and I, so I then took it into the therapy room on the Monday. And damn it, but it worked with people. It worked with total strangers coming in. And they were ooing and aahing and screaming. And some looking quite scared. And some laughing a lot. And then, of course, I, I went online and... and made a declaration of what I'd found and everybody called me a cock and it was, you know, everybody thought I was a complete and absolute idiot. Quite rightly so, looking at it now. And then, I, of course, I, I did the walk. The first workshop I did was Felix Economakis, I think uh, that was maybe the first one down south of the Swan. And it kind of, uh, it went well. And what, what happens now in workshops normally, I don't know, it'll maybe be, I just did one in Leicester at the weekend and I think we had all but one working perfectly. Nodding, turning, coming back, yeses, noes, and that will happen, but that one will get better and better. But across the board, in, in general, we'll normally get a pretty good 90%, I think, that can work in a situation like that. So we're back again to what is this one, of course. Mm. And I'm very comfortable for most people who don't understand it, who do the kind of work like, like the normal therapist would do, to absolutely say it's an idiomotor response. And I have no problems arguing with that or fighting with it. My findings are that you know, if it is an idiomotor response, it's the bloody greatest idiomotor response in the history of the world. But for me, I think it's more. Or at least I'm open to assume that it might be more than an idiomotor response for the simple reason that now we've got hundreds of people who never get idiomotor response, can't go into hypnosis, but you pull out the swan, boom, something happens. Instead of a finger twitching, the whole hand frigging nods, it comes back to yeses and noes. It can hypnotize them. The right client, we did that at the weekend. 
it can create so much things. But uh, it's just for this chart, that's about as far as I can go right now. I think, Holland. No, it's I, all about I understand chart. entirely. I understand yeah. entirely, and I and I certainly recommend very highly to all of the listeners out there that you should absolutely find out more about the Swan and then try it out. And you just and you just had a pop in it within the last couple of days, yeah? Absolutely. After our, our chat uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, how, did, uh, how did you find it? I, I found it amazing, and it was um, watching people's response to it was amazing because these are people who, you know, are sitting there and they're not in any formal sense of trance. We haven't done any hypnosis, um, yet they are getting absolutely, as you say, one of the greatest, idi- if it is an idiomotor response, certainly one of the greatest idiomotor responses I've ever seen. You know, yeah, well, that's and, and, that's... Get, and of course, your cutting edge will just get sharper and sharper the more you use it. You know, you, be, you become good at presenting it, I suppose, if I'm being honest, yeah. But at the end of the day, it depends on the, it depends on them. You can get the most positive person in the world, it won't work with. Mm. Um, and the most negative, it will dance for them. It's It becomes crazy, you know. So, interesting one. So, I mean, one of the things leading on from that is um, in TFT and thought field therapy, they they named something the apex problem, dealing with the, the problem that someone experiencing change so quickly that they begin to question it. For example, you know, someone's had a, a phobia for 30 odd years and then mm-hmm. the phobia just disappears in the space of five minutes, 10 minutes. There's this idea that they start going, well, hang on, ha- can that really have happened? I had, mm-hmm. it for, had it for 30 years. How can it really just have gone? Surely change shouldn't happen that quickly. Um, and I was wondering whether that idea that change has happened quickly has ever reared its head in that kind of way where you've had to deal with the, the shift in belief. I find that, I find it interesting because I, that's not a thing that I, and, and, I, and it was interesting your question. I, I, if I'm being candid with you, I'd never heard of it before. Yeah. i never heard of it before. And that's not been my findings. But as you tell me, and as I recognize and relate and assimilate, if you like, to what you're saying, yeah, there have been one or two like that but they happen slightly different with that for the likes of us i think i think a thing happens in the therapy room like this lots of therapists will get this i'm sure we're trying to create change and there are two basic types of change we want to create one is the eureka moment and the other one is the the normal moment so if i can explain up briefly the guy wants to lift 200 pounds above his head he's never got above 199.5 pounds we do whatever we do. He lifts 200 pounds. It's a eureka moment. He screams. He shouts. He kisses you. He gives you love bites. You don't struggle too hard. He's an attractive young man. That's, 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 just, that's just humor, by the way. Of course, that's true. But, but then we have... So that's, that's the eureka moment, yeah? Yeah. We don't have too many times with eureka moments. They are fantastic. We have some challenges with, with normal moments. So, for example, I get this wonderful fella... Uh, you, uh, uh, Joe Kim Lee, who's a, a very good therapist, he's based in Singapore, he came across a couple of months ago, he came into my room, and while he's sitting there, we've got a lad called Gary. When people come and watch me walk, remember, they have no idea who's coming in next. It could be somebody for the first moment, in session three, whatever. Uh, and what he saw was a guy coming in, and I think it was, I think I'd had a consultation with him, and we'd had two sessions, he was coming in for session three. And normally I'll work with people for between three and four sessions, but I can go five or six, but normally it's three or four. Anyway, session three, Joe comes there. I think it was the first one since he arrived off the plane. And again, I'm going to show him how wonderful I am, of course. So the fella comes in, Gary sits down, and his fear is jumping on a bus and going through to Dundee. Simple, as simple as that. He cannot travel, no, sorry, by car. He cannot drive. He can drive to some of the local villages. They're small, but they're specific. It's exactly our growth. It's exactly Montrose. It's exactly Okintugal, but it's not Dundee, and it's not Aberdeen. That he would, he, he would collapse. So um, we come in, how's it going? Well, it's been pretty normal, he said, it's much the same. Really? Oh, yeah. So have you noticed any difference? Well, no, not really. But remember, I, this is not a eureka moment. I don't, want to, I don't want him lifting 200 pounds. I want him being normal. I want him to go to drive to Dundee to get some milk and eggs. That's all I want. Yeah. And he can't do it. And he's 38 years old, and he can't understand it. So as we're just winding up before I'm going to wait to pop a month and try something else, and at this point I'm not even sure what, but we'll, we'll find out. We'll, we'll chat to your subconscious in a second. We'll see what happens there. Yeah? Meanwhile, this student who's done a 14,000-mile round trip is looking at me. I can see 
his eyes are rolling. He's got saliva coming out of his mouth. He's thinking he's made a massive mistake spending this kind of money. <laughs> and, and, and then I say to the guy, so, so you're, okay, so you're fine. And what, by the way, what, what, did you go to such and such yesterday? He says, no, actually. And then he says, I went to Dundee yesterday. I said, you, you went to Dundee yesterday? And he says, yeah. And I said, how did you get there? He said, I drove. I said, you drove to Dundee? He says, yes. I said, you realise what you just said to me? And suddenly he gets his eureka moment based on the normality, not on the eureka moment, yeah? yeah. And he says, that's right. My God, he said, I drove to Dundee. I said, buddy, how did you get home? He said, I drove back. I drove back from Dundee last night at 10 o'clock. <laughs> Joking smiles, I smile. And that often, that often happens. So it's almost the exact opposite of an apex moment. I get more of that than the apex moment. So I would love to agree with whoever comes and tells you, yeah, I get tons of apex moments. In my experience, and with the therapists I talk to, we, we get lots of that. People being cured and they're not aware they're being cured. That's my experiences. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. That actually reminds me uh, totally of a lady that I work with who everything's everything stressed her out. It didn't matter. I mean, it didn't matter what it was. You know, she could run out of toilet paper and that would send her into a, a, a total frenzy. You know, the idea of having to run to the shops. And we did some work and um, we spoke a week later and she said, I'm really sorry, how it's not a good week to see whether it's worked or not, because nothing this week's come up that would that, that's, that's kind of stressed me out. It's I don't, I don't know why the last few years have been totally stressful, but nothing's come up this week. Yeah. And um, so I said, well, just give me a call in a week and we'll, we'll see how you're getting on. And she did. And she goes, I'm really sorry. I can't, I, I'm so embarrassed by this. No, nothing, nothing's come up this week. That, so I'll let you know, you know, when something stressful comes up, I'll let you know then, you know, how we're getting on. And this went on for three, four weeks, about four weeks in, you know, she suddenly went, there was this pause on the phone when she was telling me that it, it's been all right. And she suddenly went, oh, and, uh, it's funny because I hadn't thought of it in those terms of the eureka moment and the normalizing moment, but actually, I, I can recognise. I think what was happening there was was exactly that. But we can get them, of course. We will get that because somebody will question it. But it hardly ever happens. In fact, for me, it's always, oh my god, and they and they and they seem to recognise it, and they'll even joke about it. But they'll, they'll say, I don't, I don't know what it is, but nothing's bothering me any, anymore. Yep. Just nothing, yep. nothing bothers me. I got this woman that um, tomorrow I'm going through to Aberdeen to see. Uh, her son. So both of them are clients of mine. I think I can get away with this. I'm pretty sure I can if I don't mention any names or what have you. But she, the son is uh, the son is in hospital and he's asked to see me. I'm talking to the mother just yesterday and I, I'm going to talk about the mother's situation if I can, Howard. She comes from uh, down south and she hasn't seen her parents for about 20 years or so. She wants to go back down south to go and visit them. And as hard, as difficult as this is, sometimes we get we get giggly moments in the, in the therapy room, and we know they're not funny. They're not funny moments at all. So it's a kind of a nervous giggly moment where she says she wants to go and see them, but she's just she's anxious. She's anxious about going home to see her parents in, in the north of England, and she worries about her parents because she's now in her late in her sixties. They're no they're, they're no I think it's one ninety two and one's eighty nine. And, and I says, well, you know, they'll, 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 they'll be passing away one day. You know, like, she's like, no. She says, in fact, I've, and this is the bit that really, really got me. I think I was drinking tea at the time. And I think it came out my nose when she said, I've got this black dress and it just hangs there. And it's for the funeral. And it's, it's always there. I, I watch it all the time. It's just there. So she hasn't seen him for 20 years. One's in the early 90s, the last late 80s. But she's got the black dress in case there's a funeral. And she's too anxious to go down. Now, we've now got a sitcom situation now, haven't we? This is somebody should be writing this up. It would be wonderful. But the funny part was this, when I said to her, you know, you put the dress is always there. And she looked at me and she says, oh, no, 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 no. I change the dress every every year. I've got, I've got a sense of taste, you know. And that was it. So that's... This woman, she goes out every year and she buys this black dress to go and see her parents, blah, 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 blah. But guess what? We had three horrendous sessions where nothing got even close to being fixed. And then we had session four. And then I get the phone call that she's in Newcastle and everything's fine. And you think, I can't remember fixing that. I can't remember saying anything specific. But I do remember twitches. I do remember the swan nodding. I do remember, in some cases, a direct voice saying, yeah, that's it done. Yeah, thanks. And it's kind of, it's riddled with unwonder. Yeah. Mm. It's not, sometimes it's wonder, but sometimes it's complete and absolute normality. And it keeps making me ask the question, who the hell are we? What are we? You know, because can, can compared to, you know, when the world was made and the, 
I think we've only been around modern mind for only six million years. I'm talking about modern mind now. But we are, we are new, aren't we? We've, we've, we've just arrived on the block. We're just finding out things about ourselves. We've got the audacity to talk about science. When we're, just a, we're just a pinhead. We're just a needlehead. But it's all six inches between our ears. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. I'm pretty sure we can all fly. We just don't know where the button is yet. You know? <laughs> I think I it's going to be that. But, but, you know, amazing. Absolutely amazing. I think there are therapists who... Uh, just have this uh, a belief that it takes a long time and it is about deep analysis and that expectation is the thing that means that they almost can't change because they treat them in a way that allows them to perpetuate that idea that it's a serious problem and that it, it can't be fixed um how far would you say that your expectation of what you've seen is possible helps them to understand or to facilitate change well it, we, we come back to the same thing they come along can you can you help me Again, if I can steal a line from Barry Thane, I'm paraphrasing again, but his line would be, I don't know. I'm a pretty good hypnotist. I need to find out if you're a decent hypnotist. Why don't you pop along, blah, blah, blah. Same with me. I do a consultation. I tell them I have no idea if I can help them or not, but I will know or I'll have a good idea sometime within the next 20 minutes. And in 20 minutes' time, I charge them a small fee for a consultation, and I tell them if I can't hypnotize you or feel I can help with you, I'll give you your money back. I have never, ever given anyone their money back. I've had a lot of them fighting me. Uh, no, it's not true. It's, it's, it's just humor. It's just humor. I could no. feel it coming. I could feel it coming. I've never had a problem. <laughs> you set it up. You had to do I've it. I've never paid any money anyway. So, so but, but no, it doesn't happen. Because, but if you listen to my wording there, if I can't hypnotize you, I feel like I can work with you. So something will happen within the process. And, of course, it's not about getting some numbers, 5% of the population to pop them under and hypnotize them into it. It's about the therapy, isn't it? So it doesn't matter if they don't go into a deep, deep trance. We can, we can work a lot of the time with people who aren't there at all. But um, come back to the, 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 the same situation again. Something happens along the lines. I do know lots of people, um, I'm not going to mention names, I'm not going to mention the therapies, who say it is a six-therapy treatment. It is an eight-session treatment and so on and so forth. Uh, so I, I tell everyone, um, I, I exaggerate it. I say I'm an average of three or four. And normally my findings are in the last year probably... Along with the consultation, it's two or three sessions. I can say that and I can reveal that to anybody that wants to, to look at my work. And my, my colleagues, my colleagues, most of my colleagues say the same. In fact, I believe I'm, I believe I'm long. Based on what people tell me and what I read in forums, I'm, I'm working far too much with these people. <laughs> you know? But, you know, but here's, my, here's my answer to that. I get a guy that comes to see me, a, a man or a woman, they come to see me, they're anxious, they're hearing voices, they're, they're suicidal, uh, today, a woman came at a 150-mile round trip. She's 63. She's suicidal. Mm. Now, how long have you been like that? She's been like that nearly all her, all her life. How long have you had the treatment for? Well, she she's like a she's like a psychiatrist. She can tell you all about the treatment. She can tell you all about the medicines. And she's had 40 years. And she said uh, something like a dozen different psychologists working on her for a year apiece, let's say. And you know what? If I can't fix her in six hours doing what I do, a lot of people think I'm an idiot. What an amazing, what an amazing career I have. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> so years ago, I put that to bed. I mean, I used to feel bad. I used to think, I've had six sessions. I've had six sessions. I'm still struggling. I'm useless. Well, I've had 40 years of psychiatry. I've got to fix that before I even begin, for Christ's sakes. You know, they've got all the less cognitive behavioral therapy. In many cases, it works excellently. But everyone will agree that a lot of the cases we get is not because CBT did any harm. It's because it never worked. And the reason why it never worked is because we're treating a conscious problem. They don't have a conscious problem. If they had, they would have fixed it by now. Somebody should have recognized early it was a subconscious problem and come to see a hypnotherapist or a clinical hypnotist. We're going to do something with them. And that's it. But even then, I think it's okay. I think it's okay for us to have three, four, or five, or six sessions for something that's been bothering somebody for 40 years. Because if we do, Howard, if I've got somebody for eight sessions, that's a long time, is it? Eight sessions, this guy's shit. But you know what I've done? I've fixed somebody with a 40-year problem in eight hours. I think Jesus took longer in some of these cases. I've, I've read the book. You know? <laughs> so sometimes somebody touches my robes and they put me off. They knock me off balance. <laughs> That's what happens. So uh, I, I, don't get, I, get, I don't get too wrapped up in it anymore. I've got a fair idea of what I do, and I do the best I can. And I think I said to you the first time I met, you know, I have this attitude, the SW, SW, SW attitude. Some will, some won't. So what? I do my my job is to take everything I've I've got, squeeze it as hard as I can, 
and see if I can fix people. That's the deal. That's it. That's it. Just such That's good it. advice, and I think really, really amazing to hear. Um, well, I'm a Gemini. We know stuff like this. Of course, of course. You know, uh, you just it's, it's it's coming. It's the celestial knowledge coming through to you. It's the celestial stuff. Absolutely. So, what advice have you got uh, for people out there who are interested in learning more about helping people in a more rapid? Uh, focused manner what would you suggest that they do or advice in terms of training or practicing and books they should be reading that kind of stuff well my uh, my, my my background is you know i've got a whole life of direct sales so that was all to do with achieving winning so on and so forth i'm not i'm not so much involved in the winning now but in the achieving of getting it right if you for example were my best friend right now i would ask i mean listen we've got the internet it's all, it's all there. We, 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 can, we can find people, we can find things, we can find books. But more than anything, if you were my very best friend, I would say, go and find somebody who can mentor you and who won't charge you the earth, who won't be a 1,000 or 2,000 a day to talk to you. And ask them, go ahead and, and talk to them and ask them. Is there some, in fact, it doesn't have to be specifically. Is there something you can do to help me? Because even and again, when that happens, now you've got a magic background, haven't you? Mm, yeah. You're a magician, so am I. Now, I don't know if your world will be the same as mine, but believe me, I'm, I'm answering your question this way. When somebody comes up to me and says, can you show me how you do your magic? The answer is no. When someone else comes up to me and breaks that question by saying, you know what? I've got a couple of kids uh, or I've got a couple of grandchildren. I'd love to be able to do a trick. To, I mean, if there's any way, I'm, I'm, I'm going to close them before they embarrass themselves by struggling with the question. I'm going to say, let me show you something. And I will show them a trick it won't be your trick. I won't, I won't show them someone else's trick. It'll be one of my stuff, one of my pieces. That way I'm not revealing, which we are not allowed to do. So I'll show them a trick that I do, and I'll tell them to go away and enjoy it. And if they do it well when they come back and see me, I will show them another, and I leave it at that. But in other words, I am open for them to be a student of mine, and I will show them how to make people happy and laugh for years to come. But guess what happens? And you already know this, of course, Howard. They won't learn that trick, will they? They'll have a pop. They'll, they'll be absolutely shit at it. And they'll come back asking you to show them more magic. And we'll say, no, because we're not stupid. <laughs> they don't want to know. How, they, they just want to know our secrets. So back to this again, exactly the same again. If somebody came to me, somebody locally here, and asked me to mentor them, the answer is yes. The answer is absolutely yes, if I can help. And for me to mentor them in the therapy room, the answer is yes, but I charge a fee for that. But the answer is always yes. So if somebody can find somebody close to you who will mentor you in any way, shape, or form, and by mentoring, I have to explain what I mean by mentoring. It's okay to sit down with somebody and to show them, uh, 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 to give a lecture, to do a talk. Workshops are absolutely fantastic, but nothing, nothing, nothing gets remotely close to watching somebody go to work. Nothing is better than watching somebody go to work in the therapy room with a stranger that just walked in the door and said good morning. That's it. Because I can go to some of the best hypnotists or whatever in the world and watch them zap some nonbulous all day. I can watch fast induction slits coming up my backside. But tomorrow, it's nine o'clock and I have to do this. And guess what? It's not going to work. So I need to find out what happens when it doesn't work. And for me to find out what happens when it doesn't work, I need a mentor. I need somebody that makes something happen when it doesn't work. Because therapy happens when the magic doesn't work, when the trick doesn't work. Now, as a good magician, we know that. People don't know that we're making mistakes all the time. Mm -hmm. But they don't know that because we're riddled with belts and places. And we've, we've practiced, we've practiced, we've practiced, and we forgot, haven't we? We don't even know how we do it. But it's all in there. And that's the same thing with this stuff. And I would tell them to keep their nose to the grindstone and keep it there till it hurts. And after a while, the pain goes away. So don't stop. Keep practicing, practicing. I tell you, Howard, I used to hypnotize people in buses and trains and planes and in cafes, but not even talk to them. In other words, in my mind. I'd be practicing my pitch in my mind. So when it came to time to do the therapy, it was all there. All the stuff was there. I used to giggle. It was so friggin' easy. All the stuff that I'd been practicing in my mind over and over again. Who taught me that? Ford did this. Ford, this man who made all these cars, used to say he practiced his pitches in his mind for years upon years. William Clement Stone did the same. It's just, uh, so I would say, get a mentor, find out how this stuff works, but go to the cutting edge, go to the cutting edge where it is. Mm -hmm. And if that's possible, that's just wonderful. If you can get to see it really working. And you're looking for, not for the good stuff. The good stuff is easy. 
it's great when something happens and, and you know, the, the guy tries something, the therapist, and it doesn't happen. The finger doesn't switch. It doesn't lift. The, the number three doesn't disappear. What's he going to do now? Because they're in pain and you're 30 minutes into a one hour session. What are you going to do now? And that's where you start to learn stuff. And of course, it's a golden rule on top of that. Once you, once you learn how to do the thing, once you get the master, if you like, him or her, there's wonderful therapist that shows you the stuff. You've then got to do that three things, haven't you? <laughs> then you've got to see the people. Then you've got to see the people, because that's where it all happens then. It's all to do with seeing people and having a go. All of it. Absolutely all of it. So, I mean, lastly, is there anything else that, from a rapid change perspective or people interested in this sort of area that, from your experience, would be valuable to share with them? Uh, well, for me, it's remember what I said at the very start, I think, if we play us back, I'm not, I'm not, I've never seen myself as a, and I think it's great, I think rapid change is fantastic, but I've never seen myself, that's not where I am, I'm, I don't see myself as a rapid change therapist. For me, it's about contact, but it's, it's the same thing, but for me, everything happens with contact. So the only thing I'm interested in the therapy room, and I'm happy with all different forms of therapy, but for me, I'm what's called a contact therapist. I want to talk to you, but I want I want to forget you as quick as I can. I want to tell you that I need you to just go to the side, flop, close your eyes, have a dream if you want. I want to talk to your subconscious. I want to see what happens there. So, um, so for me, pick a protocol, find a really uh, find a great protocol, and become great at that protocol. And once you become great at that protocol, it just things can happen. Mind you, it's hard to find a really great protocol, isn't it? Because too many, too many people, I know that, and I, I get that, I can, I can hear myself contradicting myself as I speak. Too many people practice on the practice, and they forget about being, you know, uh, people-centric, if you like, or patient-centric. I get that completely. But if you've got a lovely protocol, then you, uh, that can take you to most places. A moment, if you, if you if you left that for a second, there's a kind of analogy, you've got the likes of Anthony Jackman saying that, you know, there's, there's a... I remember him saying there are so many inductions, but he only does one. And by the way, Anthony Jackin probably knows every single one of them and a dozen more on top of that. So, and I think he maybe does a second one, a kind of a quick hand drop, but mainly it's the it's a, it's a raised hand. I get that completely. Why do I get that completely? Because it's a beautiful induction. It happens to be my favourite induction as well. But so I have a favourite induction, I have a favourite protocol, but again, I'm scripted, aren't I? So it's it's one thing to say rapid change, and although I can do rapid change work, I am absolutely scripted. So if somebody comes to watch me work, after the third or fourth, I think, oh, my God, this guy just, he moves along the same line. I don't read a script, but I am scripted. I am totally scripted, and I'm totally rebuttaled. In other words, I have an answer for anything that happens there. Until one day, somebody will give me something, and I'll think, wow, I don't know what the answer is. That's a lovely, that's a great day, because I get to write that down. Normally, I can answer anything except no. I find it hard to find a rebuttal for no. <laughs> That's an interesting one in itself. Yeah. Lovely, lovely. The um, so if people want to find out more about the Swan Protocol, uh, find out more about the work that you do and some of the mentoring you do, the training you do. Um, how can they get in touch with you? Uh, well, they can contact me through uh, either uh, lifelinehypnotherapy.com, which is my website. It's not a super duper website, but it's, it doesn't work for me. And uh, they, they can find out about how to purchase this one in there if you go into the shop. I think it sells. I, I think it sells for thirty-two quid or something like that. They can also find the shop there if they want to be mentored by me. They can contact me by uh, uh, by telephone. There's a phone number there. They can leave a message. So they can contact mainly through the the lifeline through the the, the they can get the swan or the mentoring thing uh, through there. And of course, they can contact me anytime. If anybody's, if anybody's anywhere in the world and they want me to pop along and do a workshop, the answer will probably be yes. I want it to happen. As long as it washes its face, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, we'll manage to do something. Well, I will put all the links up on the website. And um, yeah, th thank you, Bob, again for your time. It's been absolutely amazing talking to you. Uh, and I hope the uh, listeners have enjoyed it as much as I have. Very welcome, Howard. Take care, mate. Catch you again. Thanks Adios. a lot. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, why not share it with anyone you think might be interested? And even head over to iTunes to give us a glowing review. You'll find more about what's coming up on our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash rapid change works. And of course, you'll find all the links related to this episode, plus those free five steps to getting your suggestions to sizzle over at rapidchange.works.